Buddha, or Buddha Gautama, also known as Shakyamuni Buddha, was a great spiritual master from ancient India. Born as Prince Siddhartha Gautama in 5th century BC, he would have naturally inherited the vast wealth of a kingdom. However, the prince one day left the palace in search of spiritual knowledge. After years of contemplative seeking, the Buddha attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. He then shared the merits of his practice by providing a method for other sentient beings to be freed from the cycle of death and rebirth. The rich treasury of Buddha's spiritual teachings on universal truths are studied and revered to this day for their deep wisdom and compassion. Today, we would like to share with you the sage teachings of the Buddha, excerpts of Chapter 4 of the Sutra of the Lotus of the Wonderful Dharma, also known as the Lotus Sutra. Last episode, we learned that after hearing the Buddha made the prophecy that Shariputra would attain Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, or the highest perfection, the disciples of the Buddha were grateful to this new revelation. We have gained what we never had before. Suddenly, we have been able to hear a Dharma, or true teaching, that is rarely encountered, something we never expected up to now, and we look upon ourselves as profoundly fortunate. We have gained great goodness and benefit, an immensely rare jewel, something unsought that came of itself. And to express their gratefulness and made their point clear, they told the parable of a wealthy father whose long lost and impoverished son had finally returned to him. But the son was unaware of his own status, nor did he recognize his father. So the wealthy father had to employ expedient means to approach the son in order to help him realize his true and elevated station in life. Later, he spoke to his son again, saying, Now then, young man, you must keep on at this work and not leave me anymore. I will increase your wages and whatever you need in the way of utensils, rice, flour, salt, vinegar, and the like you should be in no worry about. I have an old servant I can lend you when you need him. You may set your mind at ease. I will be like a father to you, so have no more worries. Why do I say this? Because I am well along in years, but you are still young and sturdy. When you are at work, you are never deceitful or lazy or speak angry or resentful words. You don't seem to have any faults of that kind the way my other workers do. From now on, you will be like my own son. And the rich man proceeded to select a name and assign it to the man as though he were his child. At this time, the impoverished son Though he was delighted at such treatment, still thought of himself as a person of humble station, who was in the employ of another. Therefore, the rich man kept him clearing away excrement for the next twenty years. By the end of this time, the son felt that he was understood and trusted, and he could come and go at ease, but he continued to live in the same place as before. World Honored One At that time, the rich man fell ill and knew he would die before long. He spoke to his impoverished son, saying, I now have great quantities of gold, silver, and rare treasures that fill and overflow from my storehouses. You are to take complete charge of the amounts I have and what is to be handed out and gathered in. This is what I have in mind, and I want you to carry out my wishes. Why is this? Because from now on, you and I will not behave as two different persons. So you must keep your wits about you and see that there are no mistakes or losses. At that time, the impoverished son, having received these instructions, took over the surveillance of all the goods and gold, silver and rare treasures, and the various storehouses, but never thought of appropriated for himself so much as the cost of a single meal. He continued to live where he had before, unable to cease thinking of himself as mean and lowly. After some time had passed, the father perceived that his son was bit by bit becoming more self-assured and magnanimous in outlook, that he was determined to accomplish great things and despised his former low opinion of himself. Realizing that his own end was approaching, he ordered his son to arrange a meeting with his relatives and the king of the country, the high ministers and the noblemen and householders. When they were all gathered together, he proceeded to make this announcement. Gentlemen, you should know that this is my son, who was born to me. 
In such and such a city, he abandoned me and ran away, and for over 50 years he wandered about, suffering hardship. His original name is such and such, and my name is such and such. In the past, when I was still living in my native city, I worried about him, and so I set out in search of him. Sometime after, I suddenly chanced to meet up with him. This is the truth, my son, and I will, in truth, am his father. Now everything that belongs to me, all my wealth and possessions, shall belong entirely to this son of mine. Matters of outlay and income that have occurred in the past, this son of mine is familiar with. World Honored One when the impoverished son heard these words of his father, he was filled with great joy, having gained what he had never had before. And he thought to himself, I originally had no mind to covet or seek such things, yet now these stores of treasures have come of their own accord. World Honored One, this old man with his great riches is none other than the Tathagata. And we are all like the Buddha's sons, the Tathagata, constantly tells us that we are his sons, but because of the three sufferings, World Honored One, in the midst of birth and death, we undergo burning anxieties, delusions and ignorance, delighting in and clinging to lesser doctrines. But today, the World Honored One causes us to ponder carefully, to cast aside such doctrines, the filth of frivolous debate. We were diligent and exerted ourselves in this matter until we had attained nirvana, or the highest paradise, which is like one day's wages. And once we had attained it, our hearts were filled with great joy, and we considered that this was enough. At once we said to ourselves, because we have been diligent and exerted ourselves with regard to the Buddhist Dharma, we have gained this breath and wealth of understanding. But the world honored one, knowing from past times how our minds cling to unworthy desires and delight in lesser doctrines, pardoned us and let us be, not trying to explain to us by saying, You will come to possess the insight of the Tathagata, your portion of the store of treasures. Instead, the world honored one employed the power of expedient means preaching to us the wisdom of the Tathagata in such a way that we might heed the Buddha and attain Nirvana, or the highest paradise, which is only day's wages. And because we considered this to be a great gain, we had no wish to pursue the great vehicle. In addition, though we expounded and set forth the Buddha wisdom for the sake of the Bodhisattvas, we ourselves did not aspire to attain it. Why do I say this? Because the Buddha, knowing that our minds delight in lesser doctrines, employed the power of expedient means to preach in a way that was appropriate for us. So we did not know that we were, in truth, the sons of the Buddha, but now at least we know it. With regard to the Buddha wisdom, the world honored one is never begrudging. Why do I say this? From times past we have in truth been the sons of the Buddha, but we delighted in nothing but lesser doctrines. If we had the kind of mind that delighted in great ones, then the Buddha would have preached the Dharma of the great vehicle for us. Now, in this sutra, the Buddha expounds only the one vehicle, and in the past, when in the presence of the Bodhisattvas, he dispurged the voice hearers as those who delight in a lesser doctrine. The Buddha was in fact employing the great vehicle to teach and convert us. Therefore, we say that, though originally we had no mind to covet or seek such a thing, now the great treasure of the Dharma King has come to us of its own accord. It is something that the sons of the Buddha have a right to acquire, and now they have acquired all of it. At the time, Mahakashyapa, wishing to state his meaning once more, spoke in verse form, saying, We today have heard the Buddha's voice teaching, and we dance for joy having gained what we never had before. The Buddha declares that the voice hearers will be able to attain Buddhahood. This cluster of unsurpassed jewels has come to us unsought. It is like the case of a boy who, when still young, without understanding, abandoned his father and ran away, going far off to another land, drifting from one country to another for over 50 years. His father, distressed in thought, 
searched for him in every direction till, worn out with searching, he halted in a certain city. There he built a dwelling where he could indulge the five desires. His house was large and costly, with quantities of gold, silver, seashells, a gate, pearls, lapis lazuli, elephants, horses, oxen goats, palanquins, and carriages, fields for farming, manservants, grooms, and other people in great number. He engaged in profitable ventures, at home and in all lands around, and had merchants and traveling vendors, stationed everywhere. Thousands, ten thousands, millions, surrounded him and paid reverence. He enjoyed the constant favor and consideration of the ruler. The officials and power clans all joined in paying him honor, and those who for one reason or another flocked about him were many. Such was his vast wealth, the great power and influence he possessed. But as he grew old and decrepit, he recalled his son with greater distress than ever, day and night thinking of nothing else. Now the time of my death draws here. Over fifty years have passed since the foolish boy abandoned me. My storehouse is full of goods. What will become of them? At this time, the impoverished son was searching for food and clothing, going from village to village, from country to country, sometimes finding something, other times finding nothing, starving and emaciating, his body broken out in sores and ringworm. As he moved from place to place, he arrived in time at the city where his father lived, shifting from one job to another, until he came to his father's house. At that time the rich man had spread a large jeweled canopy inside his gate and was seated on a lion throne, surrounded by his dependents and various attendants and guards. Some were counting out gold, silver and precious objects, or recording in ledgers the outlay and income of wealth. The impoverished son, observing how eminent and distinguished his father was, supposed he must be the king of a country or the equal of a king. Alarmed and full of wonder, he asked himself why he had come here. Secretly, he thought to himself, if I linger here for long, I will perhaps be seized and pressed into service. Once this thought had occurred to him, he raced from the spot and inquiring where there was a poor village, went there in hopes of gaining employment. The rich man at the time, seated on his lion throne, was his son in the distance and silently recognized who he was. Enlightened viewers, thank you for your gentle presence for today's episode of Between Master and Disciples. Join us again next Wednesday for Part 3 of Buddhism's Sacred Scripture, the Sutra of the Lotus of the Wonderful Dharma, Chapter 4. Please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television for Planet Earth, Our Loving Home, coming up next after Noteworthy News. Joyously, we wish you many blessings from the Divine. For more details, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash BMD.